Hello, hello. Welcome to Filmmakers Uncut, the podcast bringing you leading industry filmmakers and photographers to help you grow your skill. Today, I'm here with Andrew. How you doing, Andrew? Hi, I'm doing well. Nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you for coming. I usually like to start off by, you know, uh, you letting people know kind of what you do. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, well, it depends which day you ask me and which office I'm sitting in. The answer might, uh, you know, vary a little bit. Um, I I kind of wear two hats in in sort of the the creative industries. Uh, one, which is the hat I've been wearing the longest, is as an independent television producer here in Toronto. Uh, I've I started producing. My first series I produced was uh, around 2004. And uh, it was a, a scripted sketch comedy series. And since then, I've been been producing uh, scripted comedies, uh, including um, uh, shows well, Shit's Creek behind me, Son of a Critch uh, on CBC, Jan on Bell Media, uh, Kids in the Hall on Amazon, uh, to name a few. Uh, so I, I continue to do that uh, at my company, Project 10. Uh, we we spend a lot of time focusing on um developing new new projects working closely with broadcasters working closely with creators to to sort of um find find you know shows that we think can find audiences around the world uh the the other hat that i wear is as an educator uh i work as the president of toronto film school here in in toronto as well uh and that's a role that i've had for about a year and a half. Uh, I've been affiliated and working with Toronto Film School for five and a half years now, but um, but my role has evolved and changed. And now I continue to, you know, look for ways to connect Toronto Film School to industry, uh, to create uh, and find opportunities for our graduates to make sure that the, the training they're receiving is uh, you know, world class and relevant, and and ready to to transition, you know, well from the classroom to to a professional set, uh, and really support students as they build their foundations for success in in the creative industries. So uh, that's kind of me in a nutshell. I also do I do a lot of travel for work. I I, I split uh, split my time between Toronto and LA. Uh, you know, making sure that that those relationships are strong. This really is a global industry and you know that's uh I, I i spend a lot of time making sure that you know the company and the school are moving in the right direction and understand uh the responsibilities that go along with that in in a global industry that's awesome it seems like you have a lot of things on your plate which really makes sense for a producer because producers always have a lot on their plate right <laughs> um well definitely you... being a producer has has equipped me to deal with lots of spinning plates you know so right exactly uh for people who might not know what an executive producer is uh would you be able to you know let them know what exactly you do sure i mean executive producer can have different definitions uh for for different people uh so i kind of live in my own definition um my you know I, executive producer for me is somebody who works very closely with the the creative side of the business with writers um uh showrunners creators actors uh that's on one side of the, the business and then on the other side is the business side of the business which is dealing with buyers like broadcasters and distributors and studios dealing with banks uh, when it comes to uh borrowing money um working with agents and lawyers and accountants and all that so um, i kind of live in two worlds uh and for me the the responsibility of the an executive producer is to really marry the two uh to figure out how ways to create business and economics around um creative ideas and creative teams and then figuring out ways to work with uh broadcasting partners distribution partners to find audiences for those ideas very cool and I, I know there's always a confusion between like an executive producer and a producer is there a difference you would say yeah the the producer the, again the, you know people have different definitions but but for me a producer is really somebody who's 
you know, on, on the set, getting their hands dirty, really involved in the day-to-day -day operations of a production. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time on set. My job is really, um, you know, a desk job. I, it's, it's emails, it's phone calls, it's, it's meetings, it's that sort of thing. It's how do, how do we push the bigger pieces forward? Uh, I just make sure that we hire the right team to make sure that they're delivering on the vision that that all the the creative stakeholders have have agreed to. Uh, so the the producer is really kind of on the ground, you know, making sure things are are moving in the right direction. And that's a relationship that you know I I make sure I'm in very close contact with with our producers when when they're they're um, in production. Very cool. It it seems like you you've been in the game for a very very long time. Did you always realize that you wanted to be in this type of role, or did you try out different roles to begin with and kind of you know get into actually producing? Uh, I don't know if it's very very long time, but <laughs> I've been oh, twenty yeah, I've been years. Of, you know? <laughs> yeah, I've been there for twenty years. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. I've always, this is something I always wanted to do. I always had uh, an entrepreneurial spirit, an entrepreneurial drive. Um, and I got a lot of joy out of the creative side of really um, comedy was something that spoke to me very early on. And it was something I was a passionate consumer of. I loved stand up, I loved sketch. Um, and as I kind of, thought and also kind of realized that there were careers in television in in Canada and there were, were ways to get training to to pursue those careers uh I really looked at ways to marry those um those interests so sort of what is that <clears throat> how 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 could I marry entrepreneurship and love of television and films uh and comedy what what would that look like and I really spent a lot of time uh going to school but thinking and working and volunteering um th you know trying to find ways to to connect those dots uh it took a long time it was very stressful and there were ups and downs and um you know there were a lot of relationships that had to be be built and and maintained and yeah it, but it was i just had a very um specific sort of focus on what I wanted to do and a commitment to doing it. I was, uh, I definitely didn't know how to do it. There weren't a lot of um, real mentors in sort of the independent production, specifically comedy space as I was going through it. So I kind of had to chart my own path a little bit. Right. And it's good hearing that, you know, you really worked hard to get where you are because a lot of people think everyone who's successful is just like an overnight success. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It really took. Listen, you can ask my parents how long it took too. Like they, you know, they were they, you know, were very supportive, but at the same time, they didn't. And not just my parents, my friends, and and um, people that I knew and relatives and this sort of thing. I think it was very hard to to fully grasp that um, that th this would turn into a career, uh, just because it's so um elusive and there's not a lot of people who do it that's very risky uh you can't just go to school and become a comedy producer uh so it did take a lot of effort and it really was wasn't until i'm gonna say like the first or second season of spun out which is a series we produced for ctv in i think 2014 2015 where it finally felt like, okay, there's something here. Uh, I was, I was sort of starting to build a foundation for, for a real career. Um, and you, kind of, you think about that, that's, that's 15 years after I graduated from Ryerson's radio and television arts program. So it really was, um, just grinding it out and hustling and trying to figure out ways to, work with people I wanted to work with and putting myself in very uncomfortable situations in the sense that I didn't have the confidence to do things. I had to learn how to do things. Um, so, so yeah, it really, nothing was handed to me. I didn't come from a family who 
who had any connectivity to to film and television uh or comedy uh i i went to high school in halifax nova scotia uh there really wasn't a, a television industry there at the time there really wasn't a comedy scene there at the time it was just sort of this this passion that that wasn't connected to anything you know physical uh that that really drew me to this this career interesting very interesting i think that was like a lot of good advice for people to really mm -hmm. hear out and obviously you know schitt's creek was a huge huge opportunity for you how did that end up landing in your lab <clears throat> well it was after the first season of spun out and uh i worked very hard um to get spun out going and it was a very challenging show to keep on the rails um the it was a prime time um half hour multi-cam comedy series Co multi-cams hadn't been done in canada probably in about 30 or 40 years so we had to figure out how to build that infrastructure how to finance it uh the financing was very challenging um i lost you know months of sleep over that and i was doing it really as an independent and really kind of as one person it was under the project 10 banner but really that was just code for andrew barnsley um and because there wasn't a real corporate infrastructure at all i was really the only person there or here at the at the time um and i i became friends with uh somebody who really helped on the financing side somebody who at the time was was running a bank that specialized in in production lending um and he really sort of took me under his wing spent a lot of time kind of training me on how you put pieces together and the risks involved and kind of what the options were and uh you know, he kind of saw how serious I took it, how hard I worked. Uh, and and he was sort of for, you know, he was a, a real pillar of the industry in, in Toronto and Canada. And after we finished production on Spun Out, we went out uh, socially. It was the first time we ever went out socially. And th this is sort of a long story short, but but sort of towards the end of our uh time together that evening he was like hey do you think you could take on another series and i was like yeah i mean that this was a lot of work it was it took a lot out of me but i now feel i have the team in place i feel i have uh the systems in place that that i can i can do that it wouldn't be nearly as hard doing doing it the second time he's like okay well that's great he's like i have a friend uh, i'd like to introduce you to his name's eugene levy and he has a show that he's uh pitching called Shit's Creek." And that's really kind of how it happened. It was so it was one year of spun out. Uh, somebody in a in a more senior capacity with more experience and reach and expertise, kind of recognizing um, that I had something to offer and willing to connect the dots on a relationship that really uh, has changed, you know, my career and and my life and and really you know powerful ways that's insane it yeah. it, it literally gave me like <laughs> feels right there cuz it's <laughs> it's like that whole story it's you've worked so hard to get to a point and that one connection you know yeah. really really pushes you into a new place that you've never been before and um, i wasn't expecting it either it really it really mm -hmm. was a surprise and i think kind of the lesson there is you never know where opportunities are going to come from uh you have to be open to all of it uh sort of another lesson on top of that which is really the same story is after spun out was was a really tricky show and it took four years to put put together and and to finally get our first season in the can and at the end of the first season i remember being at the rap party and everybody knew kind of the the how challenging it was for me and and just how how hard it was and all, how all consuming and at the rap party somebody came up to me and said you know andrew you did it like it you actually got this this produced uh 
I, I can only imagine that you're going to take time off and, you know, maybe take, you know, six months off and catch your breath and, you know, and uh, re-energize. And I was like, no, in fact, the opposite. I've actually done something that people have noticed. Uh, I don't know if this will ever happen again. I have to work twice as hard as I've ever had to work, as I've ever worked to make sure that I don't capitalize on on this opportunity and what's been been created here. And that's really kind of that spirit and that mindset is kind of what really what positioned me really well for opportunities like Schitt's Creek. That's awesome. That's awesome. Very cool lesson. What's the most important lesson you've learned over your career, you think? Well, it's just it's it's just the importance of relationships and and I think the importance of genuine relationships. It's very it can be very dangerous going into a professional relationship wanting to get something out of it. Uh, that I think it's just important to connect with people, uh, to find like minded people that you will support, that will support you, that you'll invest in and they'll invest in and just not have any expectations or uh, any pressure. As, as you get older and your career gets older, the relationships evolve and grow. And it just, it actually all happens organically if you let it happen. Um, and that, that was sort of a surprise for me. I was just kind of being me and I like people and I like, you know, being around like-minded people that are passionate and are, you know, like to, to do big and interesting things. And, and what basically what happened is it just presented opportunities and some, some worked, some didn't, some really did, some really didn't. Uh, but, but that's just all part of kind of the ride. Uh, but it all comes down to, to relationships. Um, and that's, what's going, relationships are what's, what's going to get you out of trouble. If you get, find yourself painted into a professional corner or it's like, who do you, I always, I always wanted to be able to know who to call when, um, when I got into a challenging situation. The other thing that's sort of part of that too, I never, um, I never wanted to to know everything. Um, this was something that I kind of decided early on. I never, I never wanted to know everything, but I wanted to know the experts who I could reach out to 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 help me uh, and advise me on things. I there's I kind of talk sometimes about how I never, I really never want to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, I I just I want to be surrounded by people that lifts me up um that and i i just think if i walk into a room thinking i'm the smartest or the most successful or whatever it is that that can only go downhill i don't i i really want to surround myself with people who inspire me who i can learn from uh who can advise me who can make me laugh who can point me in the right direction that sort of thing i love that i love that a lot I think my biggest takeaway there was, you know, when you're building relationships, people not always expecting something from mm -hmm. them, right? Because exactly. a lot of yep. people these days will go into relationships and do something for that person, but then they expect them to give it back to them. And once they don't receive it back, they're like, well, maybe he's not my friend, maybe this and that, right? And it yep. really destroys that relationship in the long-term sense, right? So if you're always exactly. able to give the most amount of value in your relationship, that's where, you know, your relationships will grow and people will see you doing that as well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This question is a little bit similar. Um, it's what is one piece of advice you give to someone starting out in their career? Someone who's, you know, very new, fresh, maybe, you know, just came out of film school. What would be that piece yeah. of advice you would give them? I think, I think the most important thing, and sometimes this is tough because people don't know, um, but I really think the most important advice is to have a sense of where you want to be in the future. Have a sense of where you want to be five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Um, the reason that's so important is that <clears throat> it forces you to make your decisions, your everyday decisions, um with that in mind and you you know when you're 
<clears throat> excuse me, when even when you're deciding, you know, uh, small things, big things, if you can anchor those decisions to uh, something in the future instead of just answering questions in the present, uh, it will it will kind of help steer you in the direction you want to go to. An example of that is, you know, when I went to, after I graduated from Ryerson <clears throat> and Radio and Television Arts, I really wanted to uh, get into television production and I was looking at ways to do it, but I also needed to pay the rent and I didn't have, um, you know, there wasn't really money coming in. I was looking for freelance opportunities, that sort of thing. And I started to see that a lot of my friends and fellow graduates were taking jobs that weren't in kind of in the field that they studied or where their packings were. And the problem with that, and that was something I decided I just wasn't going to do. Uh, I would sacrifice more if I had to or figure out ways to you know, take on very short gigs or something like this. But but I was seeing people really compromising or sacrificing their 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 passions and their dreams um, because they were answering their they're answering questions in the present and basically not understanding that it, if you take a job that isn't or or uh, commit to a job, a long-term job that, or even a you know a shorter-term job that that takes you off your course, there's a very good chance you'll stay off that course. Or if you you do take it and you realize, you know, you do it for five years, which five years can fly by very quickly, and you realize you've been off course for five years, it's tough to get back on course. So it's having a sense of, you know, where where you want to go, where you want to end up, who you know the type of people you want to to work with and be surrounded by and anchoring decisions to that your everyday decisions to it um and i just think that's that's a way to, to it's really about staying on track and being pointed in, in the direction you want to go really good advice foresee your future mm -hmm. um what do you wish your younger self knew about your current profession <clears throat> um well, it's inter it's actually an interesting question because sometimes I look back at my younger self and I'm very surprised at how wise my younger self was. Even even things like I just said, like y you know, stay focused. Like somehow I knew this stuff, and and I would make decisions. I wouldn't, you know, like like I wouldn't let let money make a decision for me. That was something I said to myself. And I look back, it's like why like that's probably not how I would answer things now, but somehow when I was in my, you know, late teens, early twenties, I had this sense that uh, I was so focused on getting somewhere and having a, a sense of where I wanted to go. Um, that that I was very committed to this set of principles or philosophies that I just, I don't know where that came from. Like it's, it's really, kind of fun for me to think about. Um, but I guess, you know, I, I don't, I guess one of the things that I maybe could have thought a bit more about, and I really didn't think about it at the time, and maybe I didn't need to, just considering the way things have turned out, but I really focused on or that, I, I really focused on Canada. Um, for really the first 15 years of my career. And I didn't have, I hadn't, I, I didn't really view Canada's domestic sort of television industry as having any real global reach. Um, and I didn't know how, it, it, I had to learn very quickly how to, how to play in that arena. Um, I just think that's something in the first 15 years of my career after I graduated, I could have been thinking a bit differently about what is a connection to Los Angeles? What is a connection to London? Um, um, that sort of thing. But, and maybe that would have accelerated things a little bit. I, I don't know. I find it hard to imagine that it would have, but 
I just wasn't thinking globally um, until really kind of the beginning of Schitt's Creek. Right, right. Um, I, I know you're very closely involved with the Toronto Film School, of course. What's your take on school itself? You know, would you recommend it to someone? How do you see it? Uh, well, I'm very pro school. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple things. One, I went to school, I went to school for a long time that I really felt I needed a foundation in like an educational foundation to achieve what I wanted to do. I went to university for, for a long time. I, I've, <laughs> it's almost embarrassing to say I have two BAs. I have a bachelor of education degree. I have a bachelor of applied arts degree and I have an MA. So I was in uh -huh. school for a long time and really so much of it was, was to look at how to become a producer from as many different angles as possible. Um, um, being in school gave me the opportunity to take some risks to, to, to try things that I might not try otherwise. I produced a feature film in my um, master's program. Uh, I, I produced, you know, tell you know, short television projects at, at Radio and Television Arts, and it was such a wonderful place to to learn, to make mistakes, uh, to also it gave me the freedom to explore things outside of school because I just had the safety of school, so I could go and I could volunteer, I can meet people, uh, so it just provided school provided so many opportunities, both inside and outside of the classroom. Um, but the other, and, it, and the skills too, that went along with it. Um, and I think, here's, here's one thing that I do know too, is nobody's gonna look at what degree you have. Nobody's gonna look at what diploma you have. Uh, if, you know, if you wanna be a producer, a director, if you want to, be a grip a dop they're just uh, uh you want to work in wardrobe or hair it just nobody nobody's going to look at that but what they will look at is the skill set that you bring to to your job the um attitude that you bring to the job the understanding of the culture of the industry and set that you'll that you bring to the job and these are all um things that you learn in school uh, at Toronto Film School, you know, we, we pride ourselves on a couple of things. One is that our students are set ready the second they, they graduate. They understand the culture, they understand the hierarchy, they understand the operational side of a, a set, and they're able to transition seamlessly to that. That doesn't happen without school. Uh, it just doesn't. Um, also, in a school, you get access to, you know, um, um, experienced and expert uh, professionals at, at Toronto Film School. All of our uh, faculty are part-time faculty, uh, which really separates us from other film schools. And the, and the reason for that is part-time, if they're part-time faculty, it means they're, they're working probably full-time uh, professionally as uh, in, their, in their chosen professions in their career. So what that does is it brings current um, um, skills, current understanding into the classroom, but it also brings their relationships and their understanding of, of the, the industry and the professions in the classroom and students gain from that. So school for me, it's, it's not necessarily about the, the piece of paper you get at the end of it, although that is really nice and parents like that. Um, it's about what, what you learn, uh, the skills, the understanding, the culture, the relationships, um, all of those are, are moments for opportunity to build, to build careers. Right. Well said. Yeah. Th it's definitely very, very, I would say like person depending, there's obviously many people who've gone, who haven't gone to school and many people who have gone to school, but you know, a few things I have seen from people and friends who I have actually had go to Toronto film school, like we were talking about before this, mm -hmm. um, is that when they do come out, they are very like set proficient, like they're able to do the call outs, like everything you need, which yeah. I didn't go to school personally. And, you know, when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's what we're supposed to do on a <laughs> set, you know? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you're figuring it out. So it, it's, but it's just, it's somewhere, it, it is sort of a way to kind of fast track 
sometimes is and and at Toronto Film School the programs are are designed to be very short. There are six terms, which at a at most schools that would be over three years, but at Toronto Film School it's six terms over eighteen months. So you're you're in and you're out and you're set ready very quickly. Very cool. Very cool. I like that a lot. Um, what are you currently working on these days? I know you kind of talked about where you know you have your company, which I kind of want to get into as well. Of uh, you know, you said you. I guess you guys bring in ideas through your company and try to help people um, yeah. get their film and television shows out there. So, if you can tell us like a little bit about that and what you're currently working on as well, that would be great. Sure. Um, yeah. So, kind of how it works is there's there's seven of us who work in this office, and really, you know, when you think about what a production company is, you're really a development company. Uh, and what that means is you are you're really focused on what's next. Once you get something, uh, there is a lot of work to getting something going and you know putting financing together and building teams and that sort of thing. but but you know that that can kind of take care of itself. Um, but where the real work is is finding out and exploring what what your next projects are. So, um we uh, uh here at project 10 we have a team that focuses on creative development and working with creative teams that come in so we don't generate any of our own ideas we work closely with agents uh who will put writers and creators in front of us with ideas uh if we like them like the ideas and we like the team that's assembled around them we'll we'll talk about what kind of resource we want to put behind a project um particularly if and that's and that's informed by you know our market intelligence like what we're hearing from the buyers um if if something comes through the door it's a good team a good idea we have a sense we can sell it um that's when we get excited and start thinking about what what that can look like um so yeah so we keep a pretty strong uh development slate at any given moment we probably have you know five or six pitches ready one or two pitches out uh and maybe a half dozen i i do shows and pitches that are either on the back burner or they're making their way through through the process um and the idea is that these are shows we pitch to buyers we hope to get some development money and some development interest for scripts or uh any other sort of creative material that that makes sense uh and then if if the buyer is interested they like they like the work that we've done uh in in development they'll then consider it for a production order uh and it's it is a bit of a game of numbers too um you know we're pretty good at getting series ordered for a, a relatively small company uh but for every show we get ordered we probably have 10 shows in development for every 10 shows in development we probably you know pitched 100 shows um so it really we have to think like on on that kind of scale and and with that the realities of those types of numbers um but yeah so so right now we have we're working with some great creators um in in Canada and the US to to kind of find what we hope will be uh sort of our next big project uh but on the production side we we just finished uh uh we we, we did three seasons of the series jan with jan arden we just finished a special that's going to air this week on ctv uh we are presently delivering the second season of son of a critch on cbc and cbc gem which goes to air early january um we produced kids in the hall which is on amazon so we're we're trying to figure out ways to keep that going um and then on top of that i'm also working closely with our international partners so all of those shows have um either international distributors who represent it around the world or or a studio that is represented around the world so we make sure that those sh shows continue to get attention that they're finding audiences um and so we're working with our international partners to make sure that 
that all those pieces are moving forward. So there's a lot, a lot on the go, but our really a lot of our folks, most of our focus is on development. Production is a is a, a big piece, and our focus there is on sort of financing, building teams, making sure we're hitting a quality control, we're, we're a quality standard that we're happy with, and then also then sort of th further through the life per lifespan of a series, it's, it's distribution to make sure that you know we're maximizing audience potential around the world. Very cool. I, I really like the, I want to get into like a little bit more about the pitching process, I would say. Uh, when you guys do get pitched first off, what do you guys typically look for when someone is pitching to you guys to bring, you know, their idea forward? Um, firstly, and secondly, when you guys go to pitch, how are you guys pitching, you know, to be able to get funding for these yeah. projects? So we're pretty specific on what we're looking for. And I think that's sort of the sign of a good company. It's somebody, it's a company that knows who they are, uh, what they want to be and where they want to go. So our focus is really on half hour comedies. Um, we also tend to, because we're, we're very good at kind of maintaining relationships with talent and high profile talent, we tend to look for shows that have a piece of talent attached. Uh, which doesn't mean that we're closed to not having that that piece there, but it definitely we, we treat it a bit differently if if we think that that um, would help sell it. Um, so we, yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry. What was, I'm trying to remember the question. Well, I'm yeah, it was it was, it was difficult. So that, yeah, for sure. So it was a two part question. So pretty much like. When someone's coming to you guys, what are you looking for? Okay, uh, yes. When they're okay. trying to give you the idea, and then on your guys's end, when you guys are pitching for yes. um, to get a budget or you know money, like how are you guys pitching it on that end? Okay, yes, yeah. So like I said, we we kind of have a we have a real sense of what we're looking for. It's it is half, for us. It's half hour comedies, half hour scripted comedies. If there is a piece of talent attached, that's great. Not necessary, but what on the but what is really important is we really look for uh, and get excited about a very specific sensibility, something that nobody else can deliver. So this is why comedy is so great. Stand-up comedy can be a great place to mine from because it's really one person's point of view. Um, so what, what we like is where something is so specific in time and place and sensibility and sense of humor that uh it's undeniable that there's no competition out there because it's, this is the only show that will exist like this um and what we've kind of discovered is the more specific you get in a show the more universal it actually comes it's very um uh you know, it's almost paradoxical that way. And we've seen it with, you know, we see it very clearly with Son of a Critch. So that's a show, Mark Critch it was a piece of talent. He brought this to us. It was based on a memoir that he wrote about growing up in St. John's, Newfoundland in the early to mid eighties. I mean, you can't get any more specific than that. Um, but what we discovered is it just resonated with all types of people. It's about belonging. It's about family. It's about adolescence and growing up and first loves and all these things that, you know, were so specific to Mark and Mark's story. But as humans, we can, we can relate. And, you know, it's also a show that <clears throat> has three generations of characters in it. And that just pulls family together and, and, you know that's that's really like that's a slam dunk and when we heard that pitch we were like okay this is this is exactly what we're looking for um so it's 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 that it's something that there's a lot of, there's confidence in the creator there's confidence in the storytelling um when when you ask a question about the world or the character to the to the person pitching they just know it because it's so who they are and ideally they've lived it um so it's very very um 
deep and confident specificity. That's that's sort of the first thing we look for. We also, you know, look for um, um, comedy that has a purpose. We feel we do feel a responsibility to uh, to make sure we're putting good out in into the world. And you know, you certainly have seen that with you know Shit's Creek and where sort of the the some of the issues that are tackled there around identity and sexuality and family and class and sort of thing. You look at um, uh, Jan, which got into aging and, and feminism and all sorts of important things that, that we, we want to look at. And, and son of a critch gets into, you know, race and identity and these, like we want to be able to, talk about things and comedy is very special that way and we sometimes talk about how comedy can trojan horse ideas it makes it makes it very you can you can tackle big ideas in very palatable ways and almost catch people off guard where they're thinking about things that they might not necessarily think about and comedy just does it in a in a delicate way so we take the power of comedy um uh, pretty responsibly we have a bit of a uh a motto here it's it's uh comedy comedy with purpose on purpose uh is kind of how we approach it um so yeah so that's kind of in a very broad sense what we look for uh in terms of actually pitching you know when we pitch we work very closely we tend to work very closely with the creators getting the team right uh, getting the pitch right making sure the material is where it needs to be but when we're actually in the room whether it's a physical room or a zoom room we kind of just let the creators do the talking uh we set it up a little bit but but basically the context we put around it normally is just this is an idea that spoke to us uh you know we have you know relatively high standards of what we get excited about uh and this team and this idea uh check those boxes and this is something we want to invest in and we hope you will too and then we hand it over to the creators to just kind of talk about their world talk about their connection to it uh talk about why it's important and hopefully you know we get a, a buyer to buy a couple scripts at the end of the call very cool yeah it's it's it seems like you know at the end of the day you guys are coming in as a reputable company right and you've had shows like on your back so once yep. you're bringing someone in it's you let them be themselves and you know be the creator they are right at the end of the day and if exactly they like, them, they like them if they don't then they don't right yeah. it's just how it is uh for obviously at the very beginning when you guys did you start your company before having a few um like successful he, things under your belt he, I do. Yeah. I mean, it's, I've had a few companies. I've, I've always really worked for myself and I've had different partners. This one, Party 10 has been around since 2009. So it's, it's obviously the longest, but when I was doing my master's degree, I started a production company and I worked with a partner and I worked with somebody who's about 10 years older than me. She was a, uh, an experienced showrunner, writer, um, uh, very talented and, I just found that I could kind of be the the professional yin to her professional yang, where she was really focused on the creative, and I really wanted to kind of find that entrepreneurial um, place for for me. And and the idea of elevating what she was doing just made so much sense. And so we started a company before I graduated with my master's degree, and somehow we worked very hard, um, and we had a series ordered almost immediately after I graduated. So I've kind of just been, I've actually been in this role um, of executive producer and business owner pretty much my whole career. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear that, like, even though you weren't as reputable back then, right, it wasn't as easy, you were still able to, you know, get a show going then. Yeah, I will say this though, and this is, this is we actually partnered with an established company too to get that show going. And that was, that was really good advice we got from the broadcaster. They said, you know, we like the idea, but we would ask you to go find a company, an established company who can help you make, you make this. And that's what we did. And it, it, it proved to be the right move. And I think that's, 
that's another piece of advice is I, and it took, I was, I was pretty stubborn and I didn't like that. And I, there have been some stubborn moments where it's like, it's not fair. I've worked so hard and I've have to give a bit of it, a, you know, give a, and sometimes a, a very meaningful piece of it away. But you, you, when you do that though, uh, you can experience that one plus one equals three where you, where there can be a whole lot of upside to finding a partner that you want to work with, even though it might sting at the beginning. Uh, it might actually mean that you get your show made. Uh, and we do, we do that a lot. We look for, we work with young companies that have ideas that might be looking for um, a company like ours. You can add a bit of momentum uh, or a bit of weight to a project. And what and everybody wins in that situation if it you know if it goes so so that was one thing I I, I did need to learn to stop being stubborn uh, and and it was not <clears throat> it wasn't about greed it wasn't it was really a bad it wasn't necessarily about control it was just I had a very hard time with things that I worked so hard that I lost sleep over that uh, were just you know impossible tasks and just handing them over to somebody else who ha didn't have the history with the project. Um, but as soon as I kind of got over that, that really helped as well. I think that's really good advice because a lot of people are scared to, you know, hand over that project. Usually when they've wor been working so hard on it, like their entire life sometimes, right? Yeah. But if you find the right partner, the right partner will get that. They'll respect that and they'll just figure out ways for it to work for everybody. Right, right. That makes sense. For since we're on this topic, like if someone was cuz we get this all the time where people are like, "Hey, I have an idea, but you know, maybe I have a script, but I don't know exactly, you know, wh where to go with it," right? So they try to go in like the funding route, you know, through a telefilm, try to get funding and maybe, you know, get an episode out possibly. But then you you know sometimes it doesn't always go in that route or you don't get funding. What would you recommend like to those types of people? Yeah, I think you know like a lot of my advice kind of is the same. It's it's it is about relationships and it's about people and it's about how do you get the attention of people uh, in organic and genuine and authentic ways um, and a lot of that comes down to you know really often physically putting yourself in places where those people are so it's what are conferences you can get to what are seminars you can get to what are cocktail parties you can get to it's just how do you how do you build that network out uh and and get to know like-minded people people who are the same age as you people that are 10 years older than you and and people that you can just kind of you know learn from their mistakes or you can share their your mistakes with them and and i just think it if it, this is like any industry they can be pretty small and and community oriented and this is definitely that but it's also a very uh it can be a very welcoming industry too um i you know maybe that's the canadian side of it but I really see people looking to raise people up, uh, but that comes down that that comes down to um, just you know genuine, authentic relationships, right? And and then so then the task becomes how do you how do you put yourself into situations to 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 make those connections? And it really is it is conferences. You know, my my career really changed when I started going to the Just for Laughs conference every year. And just started to, you know, uh, kind of bake myself into that professional community. And you know, even before I started, I would go to comedy clubs and I would meet the managers and I would meet the comics and just in, in very kind of real ways, just get to know people. And over time, you know, you start having conversations and you start collaborating and you start having ideas of where your career could go. Um, and and it kind of nothing ever moves fast enough as i'm sure you know and you, you know i certainly felt that when i was starting out but then you know i look 
now, like having done this for 20 years, things actually moved at the pace they were supposed to move. Uh, uh, but there were days where it's just like, why isn't the phone ringing? Why are I getting emails? What am I doing wrong? And what, what can I, can I be doing better? Um, but all of that was just kind of how it, how it played out and kind of probably rightly so. That makes sense. I, I always preach like being patient because yeah. a lot of people just want it so quickly. Right. But you never know where the opportunity is going to present itself. And sometimes it just comes very randomly, which you would yeah. have never expected before. Exactly. Yeah. But it's just putting yourself in those situations where that can happen. Exactly. Relationships, 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 key, key, yeah. key. And yeah. school really helps with that. I think that's one yeah. of the biggest thing. I, th I probably interviewed like 50 to 100 friends who are like gone to school. I'm like, what, what did you really learn in school? And relationships have come up a lot of times, right? Yeah, to exactly. be able to get your foot in the door or someone from your school goes and gets hired somewhere and they're like, oh, we need this person. I know you, right? So yeah. they bring you in. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I am pretty much good to go. I really enjoyed this. Is there anywhere people can find you? Is there any last pieces of things you want to, you know, say yeah. anything you want to advertise, anything like that? Let it all out. No, I mean, I really think this can be, this can be such a rewarding and wonderful and positive business, but it can also beat you up too. And it's, it's really, I've, I've been there. I'll be there again. Um, I think it's just understanding that and knowing, you know, when you're, when you're pursuing your dreams or you're pursuing great big ideas, there are going to be ups and downs and there are going to be days where it doesn't make sense and you want to quit. Um, the real, the real secret to all of this is not quitting. Um, it's, it's, it's staying focused, staying committed, working hard, uh, you know, not losing sight of what you want to do, trying to move one step forward every day, whether it's a big step or a small step. How do you, how do you feel progress every day towards, towards where you want to go? Um, but also I think it's just important to know that it can be done and you know we look at the landscape now it's it's you know the 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 voices that are being celebrated now the the and being elevated and the opportunities that are being created for for you know all sorts of people and it's it's really it's really opening up in a lovely way and it, but it, what it does come down is to believing in yourself and, you know, having support from friends and family and, you know, <clears throat> staying, staying on, on, on the path. Uh, and like I, like I said, it's just, it can be such a wonderful and beautiful career. Uh, and it's important to, to celebrate those successes, big and little when when they happen because they they don't always happen but these are these are careers where you know a lot of there is a lot to <clears throat> to to celebrate and we're you know we're in the storytelling business we're in the culture business uh we're in the business of empowering people and elevating voices and i'm very proud of the work that i've done my teams have done and i'm very proud of people who take the risks to, to pursue their dreams and to get their uh, voices out there. Very inspirational. I love that a lot. I love that a lot. This, this has been so good. I really appreciate your time. I think this podcast will go on for centuries and people will be able to watch it over and get great value out of it. Uh, amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, it was a real pleasure to talk to you. And, and if people want to learn more about me, they can go to project10.ca which is our website i also encourage people who are interested in a career in the, the creative industries to, to check out toronto film school there are really interesting programs there's a, a wonderful community there uh and like i said i am a believer in education i think it will help uh those are decisions you'll have to make on your own but uh it might be might be worth checking out so uh yeah thank you for this Puya, it's really nice to speak with you and, and congratulations on this initiative too. And good Thank luck you. with everything you're doing. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Thank you for hopping on. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.